The Athletic. The race is on, and the end is nigh for the 2023 Formula One season with the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix just a few days away. But there are still some battles to be decided. Will Mercedes or Ferrari be best of the rest behind Red Bull? And could Aston Martin complete a remarkable comeback by getting ahead of McLaren? I'm Ed Shaw, and joining us to tackle this weekend's big talking points are Ben Anderson and Glenn Freeman. Well, Glenn, welcome back. Have you recovered from the reaction to your controversial comments on the race website earlier this week? Uh, what, what controversial comments were those then? I don't say anything controversial, Ed. Just some suggestion that, that Las Vegas had perhaps cast aspersions about one of the most famous races in Grand Prix racing staying on the calendar. Oh, you mean when I dissed the Monaco Grand Prix? Uh, yeah. Um, I I think I've recovered. I'm, I'll admit I've not really looked at social media in the last couple of days. And every so often I forget that I've angered most of the internet and I open it sort of absentmindedly as we all do. And then return to another barrage. Um, so, yeah, I'll admit, I, I may have muted that conversation now just to give myself some peace. Uh, I think it's a it's a sign of how passionately people feel about um, some F1 traditions. Uh, but I would say I've got a few, it was a few hundred negative comments and uh, the number of likes were in four figures. So uh, lots of, maybe a silent majority actually agree with me, but I haven't heard many comments from them. <laughs> That's the problem with the silent majority. They rarely stick their head above the parapet. They're not backing me up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you know they're there. You know they're there. And Ben Anderson, have you done anything controversial or interesting or indeed anything at all of late? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think I'm for, forever controversial. I've had a pile into the, the drivers about Vegas and them trying to desperately make it more boring for next year. So... No doubt that's in the process of offending many people as we as we record this podcast. They're trying to protect Monaco by making sure Vegas isn't exciting next year. That's what yeah, you mean. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe Monaco can learn some lessons. Well, I think it's going to struggle to uh, have a Vegas style layout, but uh, yeah, well, that that is a topic we're going to come back to a bit later on in the podcast. In fact, but we're going to focus initially. What do, you, what do you mean they can just bulldoze all the apartments, go all the way to Monton and back, just have one massive straight for miles and miles? They could outdo Vegas at their own game. Yeah, and they've been doing land reclamation there, haven't they? So perhaps they should land reclaim a circuit. That would be a a better track. A yeah, novel, a I'm novel way that. to do it. Loads of space in the sea. Easy. <laughs> You could have the world's first floating Formula One race. Exactly, yeah. That's that's the kind of ambition that Monaco needs to have to ensure its relevance in the 21st century and to satisfy Glenn. Uh, but yeah, it, it's an interesting little topic that we will revisit. But let's look at Abu Dhabi. This weekend, the last race of the championship. And there's a few things still up for grabs. Admittedly, none of the particularly headline-grabbing things. They've all long since been decided. But still, some interesting storylines nonetheless. So Ben, first of all, Ferrari's just four points behind Mercedes in the battle for second in the Constructors' Championship. Could nick the runner-up spot, having been behind all season so far. Does it matter? Well, it doesn't matter enough, does it? It's faintly amusing that Abu Dhabi pays through the nose to have the season finale. And of course, it had the mother of season finales in 2021, but the last two have just been damp squibs. And most of them are, really, unfortunately. We don't get enough final race title deciders. But we get the title decider for second place, first of the losers in the Constructors' Championship this weekend. I bet everyone can't wait. Um, f- to answer your question seriously, I'm disappointed by the, the, the state of Ferrari and Mercedes still. I feel like as much as Ferrari have kind of got themselves under control, let's say, over the course of this season, particularly the second half, really, it just feels like they're going back to where they got to at the end of last season, being very competitive on very particular tracks, street circuits, ones with predominance of low speed corners where good traction helps you out. Quick in qualifying as well. Quick in qualifying as well, yeah. They've been relatively the second fastest car on Saturday, most often, I think, across the balance of the season. They weren't executing very well in the first half and Mercedes, even though they didn't have the second fastest car or even the third fastest car a lot of the time, were just picking up the points metronomically. And they, 
just as they seemed like they were building some momentum towards next season, talking up this floor update that came for Austin. Obviously, Hamilton had a really strong race there to second, but the car was illegal. Now they just look a bit lost again and certainly won't be full of confidence heading into the winter. I mean, Toto's already said he doesn't care about whether they finish second or not. You know, it doesn't matter to him. His eyes are on the big prize, obviously, but it just it doesn't feel like it's any closer to to Red Bull. And yes, Ferrari, you know, they, they went into the winter of 22 with this target of, you know, reducing the drag on their car so that they could fight Red Bull in the races. I mean, it made sense, you know, in the first half of 22 when Leclerc was sticking it on pole almost every race, he was getting beaten by Max because of how efficient that Red Bull was in a straight line. Max could just relentlessly hunt him down and then overtake him. But they almost veered too far in that direction. And then we see these kind of impressive peaks in Monza where Sainz was on pole and obviously Vegas where Leclerc had a, a, a great performance, but a very familiar to 2022 Ferrari type story where he looks like he might win, but ultimately doesn't have enough of a Verstappen. So what can Ferrari do to build on that? That's the key question. And hopefully they can answer it over the winter, but, of course, in the meantime, they've just let Red Bull off the hook for a whole 12 months and they've spent their time refining their concept, working out ideas while they've been hamstrung by this cost cap penalty to pour everything into 2024 and RB20. So could be an ominous picture. I don't want to depress myself at the start of this podcast. Now, let's hope that Ferrari and Mercedes have a brilliant Abu Dhabi, great momentum into the winter, and then they come out and take it to Red Bull next season. Fingers crossed. That's the spirit. <laughs> I'd be curious, uh, curious about that Toto comment about saying he doesn't care. I, I, I'm curious to know if he's speaking there as the boss of an organisation that potentially pays bonuses based on championship position. <laughs> so it could be a lot of normal people uh, in that team who, to whom, uh, second place might be quite financially important. And uh, on the constructors' championship in general, we we only talk about it when there's nothing left to talk about, don't we? Correct. And the cliche is. It's it's the championship that pays the prize money. So it's a big deal to the teams. But as Ben outlined there, I feel like the reason, beyond the fact there's nothing else to talk about, the reason this one feels significant is that Mercedes and Ferrari are trying to position themselves as the team who are going to take the leap and get on Red Bull's nerves next year. With, you know, we've had Aston Martin who started the year great and a as we're talking later, we've rediscovered some form. You've got McLaren who have found all this momentum and at times have looked like they've now jumped these two as potentially being the big threat for next year. So there is a lot on the line for them in general, even if what happens this weekend isn't massively important. What I find interesting about the fact that Ferrari have dragged themselves back into contention is, is what Ben said there. Mercedes were kind of ahead because they were the team that was executing well. They, they very rarely over the balance of the season were the team that ever really had the second fastest car. And when they did, it was on the weekends where Ferrari or Aston were nowhere. It was never really because Mercedes did something right. Now we've got towards the end of the season. I've kind of bought into Ferrari's narrative ever since Monza, when they keep telling us that now, now we understand the car. Now it's starting to do the things we, we expect it to do. They may just be talking a good game, but, I'm I'm believe I'm choosing to believe them. And I feel that the fact that this is so close now is a reflection of that. That even when the car's not as good, Ferrari's probably getting closer to what the maximum is out of it every single weekend. And that has brought them back into contention in this kind of meaningless battle. I think the encouraging thing also for Ferrari fans is the points they've left on the table this season. You can put down to what you might call low-hanging fruit for the team. See things like Leclerc's engine going bang at the first race and then him getting a grid penalty for the next race as a result of that. Silly miscommunication in Monaco, qualifying. Sainz having his random issues in Vegas, not starting the race in Qatar. These kind of... I mean, it's unfortunate these are things that Ferrari have had, actually had a lot of problems with. It derailed Vettel's title campaign in 2017. These These silly mechanical things that really a top team should should not suffer too much of. Whereas in Mercedes' case, the points they've kind of left on the table have been d- 
down more to driver error. You think of the several crashes that Russell has had and Lewis taking himself out by trying to overtake both Russell and Verstappen in one go in Qatar. There haven't been many. Melbourne, probably the only one I can think of, Mercedes mechanical failures that have cost them big points. So there isn't a lot in terms of performance that Mercedes have left behind, whereas Ferrari, I think, would probably have a bit like in 2022, have second place quite nicely sewn up if it just wasn't for a few unfortunate circumstances. I think when it comes to this battle, probably who wins it is a little bit by the by. They'll both want to do it because you always want to finish ahead of of your competition if you possibly can. But I quite like what Ferrari have been doing insofar as they seem to be understanding what they've got pretty well and extracting relatively consistent performance out of it finally and achieving some of their technical objectives. That's the thing that I think is quite encouraging for them in terms of showing that they seem to get roughly what's going on, which they didn't always seem to. It doesn't absolutely guarantee that it means that everything that's going into next year's car is right, but it suggests that they've got decent understanding. They're not getting blindsided by things as Mercedes seem to be with a concerning regularity. So that, that's why I think Ferrari have looked a little bit more convincing. Like, it doesn't mean they're going to be on Red Bull's level next year, but it's signs of knowledge being gained, let's put it that way. Well, they haven't scored any ridiculous strategic own goals like they did last season. But is the performance window of the car wide enough? No. Are they going to be able to widen that window and look stronger on those more complicated, particularly front-limited circuits compared to this season without losing what's made the car strong in certain conditions this season? Like That's where they give up so much to Red Bull. Red Bull being able to be so strong at so many different circuit types and balancing out the ride height demands. Ferrari car performance looks too narrow. And they still have the tyre degradation problems. The big thing they kept talking about at the end of 22 was, yeah, one of the big reasons we suffer in the races, apart from obviously the fact Red Bull got their car lighter, so they were more dynamic in the second half of the season, was this rear tyre degradation. It doesn't seem like that's become a strength this year that was something they specifically targeted ed maybe you know better if it's become less of a weakness but it still looks to me like the ferrari fires its tires up very well but doesn't hang on to them unless it goes super slow like science and the clerk did in singapore so a, a lot of the sort of big picture weaknesses are still there plus the one they created for themselves by going down this low drag route for this season and the only things that really have been fixed have been the the really obvious stuff like the strategic messes that they kept making under Bonotto. And of course, on top of all of that, while they've been trying to sort of get themselves in order this year, Mercedes too, the teams behind, as we mentioned, Aston and McLaren have got closer, much closer than last year. So the gap that Mercedes and Ferrari had to the rest has undoubtedly closed this year. So they've got people hunting them down as well as having kind of let Red Bull off the hook for 12 months. Yeah, there's still a lot they need to do. Next year's car will be very, very different. Enrico Cardillo, their chassis head, has said it's going to be a brand new car. Very, very different, major architectural changes. So all of that is yet to be answered. But I just like the fact that they seem to have a decent understanding of what they've got at least. That's something. Because if they can dependably get what they can out of this package and understand it, that means at least they've got a certain amount of knowledge that makes sense and is consistent and can be applied. Whereas Mercedes, sort of one weekend, you think, oh yeah, they're really making progress. And then another, you're like, it's all going a bit wrong. Both of these teams are relying on that whole new car, clean sheet of paper for next year thing, aren't they? So you don't want to read too much into their car characteristics at the end of this year, but I think you can read into their their understanding of the cars, what makes the car quick and their understanding of the rule set. But it's going to be a big, Big ask for them to come up with a completely new car concept, obviously following a direction, I would assume, that we can already see out there. But when you do your own version of it, the chances of you getting it right straight away aren't that high. So they've got a lot of learning. That learning will be going on at the moment back at base, but there's a a whole next level of learning that's then got to happen when the car exists in the real world and when it hits the track in the real world. So... Even if they do a good job over the winter, they're still surely going to be playing catch-up 
when we get to kind of February, March time. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to look at it that way, they've perhaps passed their basic 2023 F1 car design module, but they still need to go through intermediate and advanced to get onto uh, Red Bull's level. So <laughs> <laughs> they've done what they can. They've got a bit of a foundation, but yeah, still a lot to be done for them and Mercedes. But yeah, ultimately they've got they've got less than 50% of the points of Red Bull, even with Red Bull not perhaps scoring as many points as they could have done because of uh, Checo Perez's uh, struggles at times this season. So yeah, big old challenge, but well, they might as well finish second, one or the other. Can they beat Max Verstappen in the 2024 Constructors Championship? That's the that's the big question we need to answer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But there are a few Drivers' Championship positions to be decided. The top three are locked. Tight battle for P4 with Carlos Sainz, Fernando Alonso, Lando Norris and Charles Leclerc covered by 12 points. But probably, Glenn, we should talk about the man who secured second, Sergio Perez, because we haven't really talked about that yet. Does that at least help to salvage his season in your eyes? Um, I suppose so, in that Red Bull's goal has been to achieve its first ever drivers' championship one two. But when you look at the when you look at the points gap, it's a hollow achievement because it's it's a reflection of how dominant that car is in the hands of Max at least, that Checo can be so far behind and still be in second place. I, I you know, there's never been a gap this big between first and second so he's ticked the box kind of but I don't think that's going to trick Red Bull into thinking great he's the guy we need he can bring home a one-two in the championship Uh, I think Christian Horner and Co are a bit smarter than that yeah I don't think anything's really changed in terms of the global Perez problem he's certainly calmed things down you know the Mexico first lap thing was just bonkers even though his kind of underlying performance had started to uptick again after like disaster of Qatar. And then Brazil, he was decent, although he should have beaten Alonso. And Vegas, he was the most lucky guy in the gamble of the safety cars in terms of their timing. You know, it played massively into his hands, but going for that early stop and being on the alternative tyre strategy. He should have really won that race having got into the lead. And that kind of sums up, I think, where he's at. You know, he's got the perfect opportunity to run off into the distance he can't do it and he gets overhauled by both Max and Leclerc who's in a in a weaker car and still you've got that qualifying problem you know Max is up there fighting for pole just about even though it wasn't the perfect conditions for for Red Bull in terms of qualifying in Vegas and Perez can't get out of Q2 so if this continues and all these other teams do start challenging Red Bull next season or the year after if it goes to that point for Perez you know he's just going to become as we've said before more of a problem I can't see it even though he's kind of pieced himself back together in the recent races and it's a relief I guess that he finished his second in the championship I mean that's the absolute bare minimum it doesn't look like he's suddenly become a better driver than he than he was earlier in the season and that wasn't good enough either Yeah, really, he's just got himself onto an even keel, I think, which is quite important for him. But it's far from everything, a bit like with Mercedes and Ferrari, really, isn't it? It's it's a small victory, but there's there's much bigger battles to be fought. So, yeah. Clawing their way back to square one is what it feels like. Well, pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Red Bull will be pleased, but um, yeah, still a long way to go. Yeah, I I think the level he's got himself to now is what should be his bad days level next year you know when it's oh Checo wasn't quite happy with the car or things didn't go his way he should be doing what he's been doing in the recent races he hasn't yet got himself to a level where you go okay that's what we need the kind of driver level 1.5 where you know it's ideal if you can't really trouble Max for us but you should be comfortably backing him up and and not not being so vulnerable to the cars behind so while he it's good to see that he's he's recovered some of the form. He hasn't got himself back yet to a level that even if he performed like this for the rest of, well, throughout 2024, I'm not sure even that would convince Red Bull that he's worth keeping. 
Of course, it would be wrong to chat about what's on the line in Abu Dhabi without talking about the big competition that is the Race F1 Cup. As you'll probably know by now, the Race F1 Cup is a bit of end of season fun where we've pitted drivers in head to head matchups over the final few races of the year. We had the semi finals in Vegas, which means it's now time for the final. And joining us once again to tell us all about that exciting matchup is our social media guru, Megan Cancel. So, Megan, can you give us a quick catch up of what happened in the semi finals and our lineup for the main event, the final? Hi, I can, yeah. So the the maybe more interesting semi-final between Sainz and Hamilton was actually quite close in the end on track. Uh, it ended up P6 versus P7 in the race, and I think there was only a couple of seconds between them. But ultimately it was Sainz who finished ahead of Hamilton. And then Gasly versus Norris, which was a second semi-final. I, I mean, it could have gone either way with Norris not having a particularly good qualifying, but obviously he crashed. So Gasly went through, meaning the final is Sainz versus Gasly. Yeah, quite an interesting lineup for that one. Looking forward to seeing how that one plays out. But Glenn, you helped conceive this whole idea. So has it played out vaguely as you expected or a few surprises? No, I was certain that Pierre Gasly was going to get to the final all along when I first came up with the idea. And when we say came up with the idea, I mean stole it from NASCAR driver Denny Hamlin, who did the same thing on his podcast in the middle of the NASCAR season. So, uh, But this is the beauty of it. We've all It's a cliche, but we've said... Behind Max Verstappen, this season has been interesting and unpredictable. And these cup results in every single round, there's been a surprise or two. It's proved it. You can't you can't look at what look like really obvious matchups and be certain who's going to go through. Yeah, absolutely. Pierre Gasly in the final is living proof of that. And as we discussed, Megan, you did cheat originally and go for two picks that you tipped to win. And one of them has made it to the final. Admittedly, you did a lot better than I did, given that my pick, Sergio Perez, basically crashed out almost instantly. So are you now expecting victory? I mean, yes, but I mean, Gasly's got this far, so I can't 100% say that I am confident. There could be something that carries on the streak for Gasly, but I think generally, yeah, I'm pretty confident that science is going to win it. Yeah, how about you, Glenn? What do you reckon? Who's your money on? It's definitely Gasly. He's come this far. He's the story of the of the cup, and I think he keeps he keeps finding a way to get through every single round. I I, I think he's going to be an unstoppable force in the final, even if that actually means that science will have some bad luck, which I think has happened to some of Gasly's opponents along the way. But that's the beauty of the cup. Yeah, very much uh, a surprise to have an Alpine driver, given they're so middle of the road, but he's having a good run. Just looking historically, I did look back at the 21 Grand Prix this season, and only four times has Gasly had the better results. So that means that history is very much against him. But like you say, he's been the the real success story. So uh, the question is whether he can go all the way or whether it'll be like one of those heroic runs to the final and it's a walkover for Carlos Sainz. It's going to be a great subplot to follow this weekend. We'd like to thank everyone listening who's followed along on the podcast and on social media. One of you who correctly guessed the winner at the beginning of the tournament will be winning a subscription to the Race Members Club. So Megan, can you tell us when that draw will be happening? It will be happening pretty soon after the end of the season. Um, Maybe we'll just get the post-race Monday out of the way and then after that it will be drawn. Um, We've got the post with all the comments, the original comments on saved and bookmarked so it should be easy enough to draw the winner. I'd be very interested to know if anybody's gone for Pierre Gasly originally. That would have been a uh, uh, a big shout, but I'm sure uh, just about everyone was uh, backed by someone. So let's see how it plays out. So great stuff. Thanks very much for joining us as always, Megan. We look forward to seeing how it plays out. Thank you. All right, Glenn, I seem to remember saying on this very podcast not long ago that McLaren had the battle for fourth in the Constructors' Championship 1, which subsequent events have suggested was perhaps a little premature. Aston Martin's 11 points behind now and in with a shout in Abu Dhabi. So how big a surprise is its arrival? Yeah, a massive surprise. I think we were all declaring this fight was over even before McLaren overtook Aston because you could see, you, you could look at the, the, the rate that they were catching Aston Martin at and you thought, well... This is a done deal and it's it's incredible really. Obviously Aston's recovery um has been quite good, but there's obviously been some some McLaren mishaps in there that have those two factors have combined. Aston haven't really, I don't think, got themselves fully back into this fight, but some unfortunate circumstances on McLaren's part mean that Aston getting their act back together has actually bizarrely brought them back into contention for this weekend so i as much as i would love ed to mock you for uh for being too presumptuous in your prediction 
Um, yeah, I think, unfortunately, in this case, uh, I have to side with you and say, yeah, I, I thought that a long time ago as well. Yeah, and Aston Martin have probably benefited from going a little bit back to basics with their car and just focusing on the fundamentals, not overcomplicating it. And it's shown that that car has decent a level of performance in it. And also, Lance Stroll's come to the party as well, Ben. A couple of fifth places in the last two races, decent race in Vegas. So he's got back onto an even keel again after his trouble. So he's another one who's who's finishing at a, a decent level, still with more to go, but doing a decent job at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. I've been impressed with him the last couple of races, and he seems to have taken a lot of confidence from the feeling he's getting from the car as well. He was saying, I think, ahead of Vegas that he always knew if if the car could behave in a way that he was predicting, then he knew he could get a lot out of himself. I mean, I don't think that's revelatory. We've seen that when Stroll's comfortable, he is capable of some fairly impressive peaks. It's just those peaks don't happen often enough and they don't happen across a wide enough range of car behaviours or track types or setup types for him to be a, a truly elite contender. But he's done very well. I'm quite impressed with how Aston Martin has kind of dragged itself out of this tailspin. I felt like from the way Alonso was in Qatar and the races subsequent with the Austin upgrade mess and Mexico and what Tom McCulloch has now described as public experiments, that they really just looked like they were lost. You know, no one had talked up an update on that car really since Canada and strolled. Well, they were lost though, weren't they? It wasn't, they looked like they were lost. They were yeah. lost, hence the public experience. Yeah, they, they did. They looked completely lost and like they were just heading completely in the wrong direction. And you start to think, well, is this, you know, obviously massive ambitions, but is this just a fundamentally midfield type limited team that, okay, it's done a good job with its Red Bull copy concept, but has it really got the wherewithal to build on that? I mean, that question still isn't really answered because they've obviously just got themselves into a nice reset place, having made a bit of a mess. And then McLaren on top have just had a couple of races where they've let themselves down, you know, Vegas, I don't think would ever have suited that car's strengths. But at the same time, they didn't really get qualifying right. I think they misunderstood the tyres a bit. Norris was saying that they were lulled into a full sense of security by the way other teams were running. And in the race, actually, Piastri looked strong at points, but the strategy was just offset. So I think in performance terms, McLaren is is the horse that you'd be backing to make the, the jump next season, even though Aston looked like they're finishing quite strong. And whether or not they end up ahead of McLaren or vice versa in Abu Dhabi, I don't think changes that picture. I think um, Aston's recovery is just that. It's just a recovery back to a kind of a level that's okay. They've, they've got this car working again. They haven't made it miles better. It's not like they've put something back on it and found a load of performance. They've just kind of gone back to where it maybe was before and they've made the car workable again. So as Ben said, there's a massive question there of we still don't know, are they capable of taking the next step? And on the stroll thing, it's good that he's got his act back together. But if you look at his whole season across the balance of all of it, not just the the terrible dip we had before he got his act back together, it's still... It's a mostly underwhelming season with a couple of reasonable points in it. If you flipped it and his whole season had been pretty good and then he had a couple of bad races at the end, we wouldn't be saying, oh, well, look at Lance Stroll. He's having a terrible season. He's he's useless. So just because there's been a couple of good races at the end, kind of it doesn't completely undo the, the damage of his year because if he'd had a more consistent season... Aston Martin would probably still be ahead of McLaren, given that they're only 11 points behind now. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I think the uh, the Aston thing feels a little bit similar to what was going on with Ferrari. You know, Ferrari's car, I mean, all season it's been described as very peaky and unpredictable, but it was particularly so in the first half of the year. And then probably since the Austria upgrade, they've managed to calm things down quite considerably and then use a certain setup direction which has helped science in particular to just calm things down and make the car 
easier to drive. You know, Gary Anderson talks often about it being better to have a car with a slightly lower performance ceiling that has a wider window that's accessible for the drivers than just chasing always that pure performance that no one can access. And I wonder if Aston kind of just went down that rabbit hole a bit too far. Alonso was kind of hanging on to it. Stroll couldn't drive it. And now they've just come away slightly from those peak numbers and gone to something a bit more benign. And as Glenn says, okay, it's not fundamentally better than it was, but it's just that little bit easier to extract enough performance from to be respectable. And then longer term, it all comes down to what that says about their limitations in understanding. Can they engineer that out with next year's car? This season, they had a car that early on they struggled with how well it would work across a wide range of ride heights on a given circuit. So if you had a big range of corner types, they'd struggle a little bit more. So It was draggy too, wasn't it? It was draggy as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're clearly one of those teams that's, that doesn't have a, a an aero and an aero characteristic combined with a mechanical platform that works brilliantly across a, a wide range of uh, of areas and they've been trying to probably well they well, they've certainly have been trying to improve that this season so there's there's all sorts of question marks there again it's a team that has a lot of very good people that have been drawn in from all over the place new facility they've invested a lot in and had the boost of some very good results this year but yeah some interesting questions for them next year but again good just to finish off with a a bit of a mini rally at the end of the season. I still suspect McLaren will finish ahead, but Aston Martin are in with a chance and a few races ago, you wouldn't have said they would be in with any chance in Abu Dhabi. And yeah, you never know. It's, it's perfectly possible to overturn that kind of margin. But also in Abu Dhabi, Ben, there's going to be a load of rookie drivers running an FP1 and of course in the test that follows on Tuesday. So that's a test where teams have two cars. One's the young driver test car. The other is the Pirelli tyre test car, although there's not really any tyre testing to be done because <laughs> this year's tyres are being carried over. So there will be 20 cars uh, out and running on, on that one day of running are there any rookies you're particularly looking forward to seeing in action well it's going to be quite an unusual fp1 for red bull isn't it because they've tactically decided to save save their rookie running for the for the end and take both regular drivers out in the same session so that gives jake dennis a run he's a simulator guy obviously i think seeing isaac hadjar in the other car will be quite interesting ed you wrote a quite interesting piece on him after his uh alpha tauri run in Mexico and he was I guess you'd describe it as a bit of a sleeper hit not stunning overall but looked like he was doing some things that were interesting Franz Toss talked him up as somebody who would end up in F1 I mean that seems like a leap maybe but um, I don't know what you think about him so given all of that all of that noise he's someone to keep an eye on now he's in a going to be in the best car Um, obviously Ollie Behrman you know he massively impressed Haas I think they they've not been so excited to have a rookie in the car since Charles Leclerc so watching him and in, try- fact, and in fact they're more excited than, with Berman than they were with Leclerc if you remember because they were a little bit they like Leclerc but they weren't very interested in running him in a race seat let's put it let's put it that way well there you go then so he's he's even Whether more that was a sensible decision is another matter yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. question question has his logic there but but you know the fact that they've learned from that maybe and are more excited than they were even in was it 2016 that Leclerc had his run I think it was or 17 um you know that says a lot for Behrman so we want to keep an eye on him uh Pato Award in the McLaren I think it's always interesting when IndyCar driver gets a shot so I'd be interested to see how he gets on. Theo Theo Porcher as well, because just because, you know, his Mexico run was completely ruined by that mechanical problem in the Alfa Romeo. So it'd be good to see the F2 champion get a proper shot. Um and then uh Zach O'Sullivan too, I think he's in the Williams. And that's interesting just because, you know, he's coming off the back of winning Formula Three and it's always good to see a new face, genuinely new face in a Formula One car. Yeah, it's good that there's uh, going to be so many out and running and and some of them will get to do the FP1 and then the test as well, which is always a good thing. Um, Obviously, there's not much in the way of opportunities. There's only one seat still vacant for next year, which Logan Sargent, probably at Williams, is going to hang on to by uh, by all indications but yeah it's rare to get a chance in, uh, in in f1 cars and yeah as you mentioned Hadjar I'm quite interested to see on how he goes he 
yeah, made a good impression uh, uh, in Mexico. But yeah, it's just a question of how he can build from there. That's just a, a kind of first session. But Glenn, anybody exciting you from the ones Ben's mentioned or perhaps from some of the ones that he hasn't mentioned? Ben mentioned quite a few there. So every time he, he, <laughs> he did named one, saying, ah, that's another one I could talk about. <laughs> Behrman's the one for me. I've been interested in him for a long time and I'm pleased when you when a driver comes onto your radar quite early in their career you end up putting uh, your own kind of private pressure on them because if they impress you and you think oh I like, I like this guy there, he, there might be something here you feel personally let down if it doesn't go anywhere if their career doesn't go anywhere I think that's a legacy of the number of junior championships I used to cover where you would you would meet these guys at maybe like Formula Renault level or Formula 3 level. You get to talk to their engineers. You get much more access to how they work at a young age. And then the really good ones, you want to see the promise that they've shown you continue to to blossom as they go up the ladder. So I'm not as close now to the junior ranks as I was before, but Behrman is one I've been keeping an eye on. And I've just been... You know, you watch them in, in F2 and you're you're hoping, you're just thinking, like, please, please don't let me down. Maybe it's because I don't I don't want to consider the fact that my judgment isn't any good. And I, I feel that, <laughs> that by now he's quite a safe pick. But I am interested because chances to drive legitimate contemporary F1 machinery are so limited. So for, for all of these guys, I'm I'm interested in seeing how they go. And a little bit nervous for all of them because you can't go away to Barcelona this winter and do eight days of running where nobody really sees what you're up to. But if you're good by day eight, then you can make an impression and then you might get a chance like next year or in the future. None of that exists anymore. So there's so much pressure on them. The FP1 sessions are really difficult. Some teams take those more seriously than others. Some teams are understandably afraid of letting these drivers loose because they don't want to damage the race driver's car or upset their run plan. So we have seen teams, I think even Red Bull have been guilty of it in the past, where they've given a really mundane, boring kind of set of aero tests or that sort of thing. So um, it's always interesting. I think the fact that so many teams have left it to the end of the year tells us again that this, this FP1 mileage thing, it's an obligation, but the teams aren't that interested in it. So they all hang on until the last possible moment um, to use it. So good to see these guys getting opportunity just because it's so difficult now for for young up-and-coming drivers to get real mileage. Yeah, it is very rare. And perhaps this needs to happen a little bit more, really, for them to have any chance to make a big impression. I think we need a better system, yeah. Well, certainly. Certainly one driver I don't think Ben mentioned but may have done in passing was Frederick Vesti who's back in the Mercedes. I feel a little bit sorry for him because he's second in the Formula 2 Championship. He's going to Abu Dhabi trying to grab that championship. He probably won't because he's quite a long way behind, but but it's possible. And, of course, when he drove the Mercedes in Mexico, he was doing all the high fuel stuff and there weren't any particularly exciting lap times, so he was almost overlooked there. And, of course, he's not the favoured protege in the Mercedes rank so he feels like someone for who F1's probably going to pass him by a little bit but uh, should we be getting excited about him Ben do you think he's got a choice a chance to go out there and show Mercedes he's a little bit better than perhaps they think because they've got their eyes on Antonelli obviously who's uh, moving into F2 next year yeah I think that's he's in a difficult position because of that you know there's a lot of hype around Antonelli and it feels like he's the guy Mercedes are really putting their their weight behind and it's someone they would really like to see in, in Formula 1 and eventually in one of their cars. As Vesti just doesn't quite have that. I th- I think Mercedes would support him into F1 if, say, Williams decided, you know what, Logan Sargent's not doing it for us. We've seen enough. We want him out. I don't think that's going to happen. But I'm sure Mercedes would be supportive of Vesti getting that seat. I mean, I have to. I've done him a disservice because, in my mind, he he'd already lost the F two championship to Porsche. So <laughs> maybe he's maybe he's uh, if he if he can somehow turn that around, that will do him a lot of favors. Um, I think he would have to be absolutely stunning uh, and wow everyone to the point that they they challenge all of their preconceptions and the previous analysis they've done. Nothing I've heard from Mercedes suggests that 
Vesti is someone they're seriously looking at as a as a future prospect in Formula One for the works team. Yeah, I think that's fair. And it's yeah difficult to make an impression these days. But I would urge those who've just been listening to that thinking, who are all these people if, if you're not closely following the junior ranks? These young driver tests, there have been some real gems who've turned up in them in recent years. Guys like George Russell, Daniel Ricciardo, Carlos Sainz have all made a big impression in, in that sort of running. Charles Leclerc as well. So there are potential uh, stars of the future in there, so it's worth keeping an eye on them. Well, science forced Red Bull's hand, didn't he, in yeah. 2014. They were looking for any excuse not to give him a seat in Formula One, and he turned up for this Abu Dhabi test and was so impressive that they went, actually, yeah, we, we, need, to get, we need to get him in the Toro Rosso, so it can happen. Yeah, they basically just ran him as an obligation because he'd won the World Series championship that year. Yeah, and of course there were yeah, there's all sorts of interesting things about how he got onto the Red Bull scheme that weren't necessarily based upon the person who makes the decisions wanting him specifically. But as it happens, Carlos Sainz is a very good driver, so he managed to make a, a case for himself. And uh, perhaps it was no surprise he moved away from Red Bull uh, longer term. But yeah, that's just an, one example of how the young driver running can be quite significant. Right, Glenn, let's get back to what we talked about briefly at the start of the podcast. I think it merits further discussion. Can you explain why you think the success of Las Vegas shows F1 no longer needs Monaco? Oh, I'll go over this again. Um, the, the thought occurred to me during the race. Like I loved, I've been to Las Vegas on holiday. Um, it's amazing. It's crazy. Uh, and it looks. You can't tell us any more, Glenn, because no, what happens in I mean, Vegas stays in Vegas. Yeah, well, I, I went there with my wife, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> it's our first wedding anniversary, actually. Very expensive holiday. <laughs> Last time we spent any money on ourselves. Um, <laughs> so seeing the Vegas backdrop, seeing the fact this track was on the strip, it, you know, it wasn't in a kind of. Usually, when you hear that a street track in any series is is given the name of a major city. The major city might be somewhere in the background if you've got a long enough camera shot, that sort of thing. This was in the heart of Vegas. As I said before the weekend on social media, none of that razzmatazz nonsense is for me. It's not aimed at traditional fans, and that's that's fine. But I was willing to accept all of that if, A, it helps in some way boost F1's profile, because the more people that like F1, the better. Um, and... B, I could tolerate that if the track produced an okay race. And having lots of people were talking the track down before the weekend, but having sort of driven it on the game and now, the F1 game, I was thinking there's lots of long straights and tight corners. It might be okay. And it was. It's exciting. So in the middle of the race, there was lots of action. There was overtaking. And I sort of thought, this is a 21st century version of Monaco. It's got the glitz and glamour. It's got the everything's over the top. It's in a desirable destination, not saying that Las Vegas is of the same level of esteem as Monaco, but it's on a track that is fit for the purpose of the cars we have today. And my main issue with Monaco is just that the cars have outgrown it. So the race is a non-event now on the Sunday. And I would I would almost... Qualifying's great. I'd almost argue if we're going to go to Monaco, let's have a time attack and then everyone can party on the Saturday night instead of having a race. Because, yeah, I just, I genuinely don't look forward to the Sunday element of the Monaco Grand Prix um, because it's it's just too boring. Yeah, you've put together a, a decent case there. That The reason I don't really like the idea of uh, losing a race like Monaco is because of that pure driving challenge. And I think what we get with those two circuits is a very extreme example of the driving challenge versus racing quality, should we say? Yeah. In that Vegas was very good for racing. Okay, it wasn't a, you know, the, the, the circuit still required some driving. It's not utterly easy. That would be a little bit disrespectful to the drivers, but it's, it's not going to be in anyone's top ten. Exactly, is it? it's no Monaco. So to lose that, particularly the qualifying in Monaco. I think would be a great shame. And I think with a 24 race calendar, there's there's room for, for a race like Monaco as well. But it is that fundamental difficulty that great driving tracks don't necessarily create great racing and, and vice versa. Where do you stand on it, Ben? Do you think Glenn's committing sacrilege? Do you see where he's coming from? Should Monaco never be graced by F1 cars again? No, I think there's 
there's space for it because of the fact that there is no higher pressure qualifying session in the whole season than Monaco. It matters that bit more because of the fact that the racing is so difficult. And then also on Sunday, although I accept most of the races can be quite boring, if there's a smattering of rain, that changes things. And also the pressure on the pit stops is so high because that is your only chance to to sort things out often. And we've seen some high profile mess ups, I think particularly of Daniel Ricciardo and Red Bull in 2016, where he, he basically lost that race because of Red Bull messing up in the pits. There's extra pressure. The space is so tight. It's, uh, it's, it's its own unique kind of race. And I think there's, there's space for both. I agree with Glenn's point about the status of Monaco. I think Vegas is now the kind of business epicenter of new Formula One and, and what Monaco used to be, the reason it was the crown jewel of Formula One, that's gone. You know, that's that crown has been ripped off its head and sent flying across the pond. So I would still have Monaco, but I wouldn't allow it to have special status and cheap deals and all this kind of stuff because it it doesn't justify that that status in the modern era. That said, I think there are circuits if you were going to drop them from Formula 1 altogether, there are there there are, yeah, there are others that are uh, that offer less to the sport over to Formula 1 overall than Monaco does. Yeah, I think there are some clarifications I should make. I drew the comparison because of what Ben said there, the kind of the 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 glitz and glamour and the commercialization element. We heard for years that Monaco didn't need to pay to be on the calendar. Monaco got these stupid special treatments where like they could sell their own trackside signage. That's why we had that crazy thing a few years ago, didn't we? We had Tag Heuer banners when Rolex is F1's sponsor. These are all things that other races, most other races can't do. The TV director, how many years have we put up with the terrible TV direction at Monaco? The race is boring enough as it is. We don't need to just watch the lead car for 78 laps. These are all things Monaco is allowed to get away with because of this heritage and because of this commercial argument that I don't think exists anymore. And But it's I was doing a like-for-like like comparison. I'm not saying that uh, if you're getting rid of one race, it must be Monaco. My point was, if, if all of these... If all of these other arguments that we used to have for Monaco's special treatment have been taken away by races like Vegas, then, yeah, Monaco's got to kind of pull its finger out and, and get into line with everybody else. Um, yeah, lots of people, when I first made the point, said, how can you say Monaco should go and should keep Miami? I was like, well, I didn't say we should keep Miami. Miami's terrible, and Miami is the reason a lot of us thought Vegas wasn't going to be very good because that was the last new American race that got overhyped and didn't deliver. Fortunately, as a racing spectacle, Vegas delivered. Yeah, and it's fair to say Monaco is and has been for some years under more and more pressure from F1. The timetables changed so that Friday off's been got rid of. I think F1 has taken control of the TV direction now, hasn't it? Perhaps yeah. as of this year or last year? I, I think so. I think it was this year. Very, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It was this year, wasn't it? And... Even before Vegas appeared, you had races like Singapore had eroded that status as Monaco as, as the deal race. Because Singapore, right from the first year in 2008, I was there then, was a really strong race immediately with massive partner interest and that kind of thing. We shouldn't forget how important that race is as well for Formula One. So, yeah, that there are more than one race, actually, that, that fill the Monaco gap. And I must admit, Monaco does feel just as a place. I mean, we all... <laughs> you both know it well as well. It's a very old world place, isn't it? It feels very old world. And so there's a, a question of whether it's becoming almost too old world for uh, for F1, which now does have these other these other races that are filling the same role that Monaco once did. Yeah, there was, there was a point I made in the piece I ended up writing on our website where I said, this doesn't mean I don't love Monaco and appreciate it for all of its heritage and history, but... Time moves on, and I do think that F1 has moved on from Monaco, even purely looking at it from a on-track perspective. Those cars don't fit on that track anymore. I'm not diminishing the driving challenge of a qualifying lap. That's that's absolutely phenomenal. But I just it doesn't feel like a fit anymore. And it's okay. It's okay for us to move on. 
from things when we when we outgrow them. You can still you can still love something and leave it in the past. And that was kind of my argument with Monaco. And all I would say is lots of people just barked the word heritage at me on social media. Heritage, history, how can you say that? You know, I prefer my heritage and history um, in the form of Spa, Monza, Silverstone, even Suzuka. You mentioned tracks that are a phenomenal driving challenge and maybe aren't a great race. Give me Suzuka over Monaco any day. I know that's only really going back to the 80s, but there are other ways for us to celebrate and, and maintain a connection to F1's history, but in ways that um, have kept up with the relentless pace of F1's evolution. Yeah, I don't think simply heritage or tradition is ever a standalone good reason because you can you could basically use that as a catch-all to defend against any change of anything ever. So well, it, it becomes I, I live down the road from what's left of Brooklands. Should we go back and race there again? I mean, we get more overtaking than we do at Monaco. The Tesco car park might be difficult, though. <laughs> I think the other problem for Monaco is that, you know, for a long time, certainly when I was growing up and discovering Formula One, it was the street race. It was completely unique. Whereas now it's been out street raced by several different attempts to, to do that better. You know, it's a good point. Ed mentioned Singapore in 2008, but since then you've had Baku with the, the super long straight and the sort of spa type conflicting demands where you can't set the car up right because you need a lot of downforce for one half of the track and no downforce for the other half of the track. And then you've got Jeddah, which to me has been a kind of surprise hit because the the average lap speed there is crazy fast for a temporary circuit. You know, they're going quicker than they do around Silverstone on a on a pole position lap. And then now you've got Vegas, which is basically what Monaco would be if you could race rather than just drive around and not try to crash into the walls. So Monaco's just slipping down the pecking order in terms of what it offers formula one overall and what you are left with are the things that you mentioned ed you know the driving challenge and that spectacle of the time attack on that you mentioned glenn on saturday of qualifying that those things make it stand out but all the other stuff that used to make it unique and the crown jewel that's long gone so it's just another race now really yeah i think you make a good point there and perhaps there is a need for monaco to really pull its finger out and make sure that it evolves in a in a certain way I'd hate F1 to lose that driving challenge because it is remarkable and none of those other street circuits offer the same challenge as, as Monaco. It really is quite incredible what the drivers do there. But maybe there's something that needs to be done just to... It, it, it's very easy to look at a map and say, where well, you should extend the circuit and that kind of thing. But maybe there just needs to be some attempt made to create some overtaking opportunity somehow just to add a little bit here more we go the, the, race. The, the race on the floating platform we said it at the start well there we go they've got to think big ed there we go there's there's the uh it's a possibility lots of money in monaco but perhaps um i mean it's a huge thing for monaco this race they're not doing f1 a favor by existing so i think uh, f1 would quite like to put pressure on on monaco itself and the acm that runs the race to to put their thinking caps on and maybe invest in in that race so i'm certainly not going to back Monaco going because I just love the driving challenge but I do accept that it's uh the extent of it's an anach- the extent to which it's an anachronism is is concerning maybe the uh the local residents the the F1 drivers and Toto et al could club together and come up with a plan to reform Monaco for the for the modern era or just let them race Formula E cars there because they do loads of overtaking when they go to Monaco well, there we go. Plenty of uh, plenty of possibilities all, already. But yeah, I I hope this just makes Monaco think about how to make itself better rather than sounds a death knell for that circuit. But uh, I think it's an interesting point you make there, particularly in terms of the off-track benefits for Monaco. It's not quite the unique race and the hugely beneficial commercial race that it once was. So yeah. I'm sure there'll be plenty of pressure from F1 on Monaco with races like Vegas turning up on the calendar. Well, thanks very much to Ben and Glenn for your insights. Head to therace.com and don't forget the hyphen. Plenty to read there from the world of F1. Check out our other podcasts, including Bring Back V10s, hosted by Glenn. The Race F1 Tech Show with Gary Anderson, our Formula E, MotoGP and IndyCar podcast. Have a look at our video channel on YouTube as well, both for long and short form videos. Well, we're now going to be heading towards Abu Dhabi, so stay with us for everything you need to know from the world of Formula One. The Athletic.